Before we get started, we'd like to thank our sponsors and broker and posh virtual receptionists. Putin, in some ways, will be it would be less of a challenge uh, in terms of because it's clearly he's at the top. He's clearly was responsible for initiating the war of aggression. But how how far down and and what other leaders would be held responsible would be a primary focus of the evidence. I mean, who else is responsible for initiating, planning, executing this this war and has a sufficient degree of control that they could help be held responsible for the crime of aggression? Welcome to the award-winning podcast, Lawyer to Lawyer, with J. Craig Williams, bringing you the latest legal news and observations with the leading experts in the legal profession. You're listening to Legal Talk Network. Welcome to Lawyer to Lawyer on the Legal Talk Network. I'm Craig Williams, coming to you from Southern California. I write a blog named May It Please the Court and have two books out titled How to Get Sued in a Sled. A war crime is defined as a violation of the laws or customs of war as established by international customary laws and treaties. On February 24th, 2022, Russia invaded Ukraine, pushing for control in the east and south of Ukraine. Days later, on February 28th, Karim Khan, the International Criminal Court's chief prosecutor, said he had opened a war crimes investigation following this invasion. And on April 4th, President Biden called for the prosecution of Russian President Vladimir Putin for war crimes over the discovery in Buka, Ukraine, of mass graves and bodies bound of civilians shot at close range. So will President Putin be charged with war crimes, and what would that mean? Today on this episode of Lawyer to Lawyer, we'll discuss the Ukrainian-Russia war and what constitutes a war crime, the potential war crime charges against Putin and his associates. And to do that, our guest today is Professor Jonathan Hafetz. He's an expert on constitutional law, national security, international criminal law, and transnational justice from Seton Hall Law School. Professor Hafetz is also an internationally recognized constitutional and human rights lawyer. Prior to joining Seton Hall, he was a senior attorney at the American Civil Liberties Union, a litigation director at New York University's Brennan Center for Justice, and a John J. Gibbons Fellow in Public Interest and Constitutional Law at Gibbons PC. Welcome to the show, Jonathan. Hi, thank you. Great to be here, Craig. This is an absolutely horrific thing to be talking about, uh, and it's, a, it, I'm sure, a sensitive issue for a lot of people. But let's get your generalized thoughts about the Russia-Ukraine war and how it got started and, and what the prospects are as we look forward. Well, the war began from all reports and what seems very clear by uh, Russia's invasion of Ukraine. It Reached its territorial sovereignty and launched what is co- what was called an international law war of aggression uh, that violates tre- international treaties and customary international law. Basically, essentially, the practices that nations uh, engage in and are bound by. And in in addition to the invasion, which has going, been going on now since late February, we have the commission of individual war crimes within. Ukraine, that is uh, what seems to be the indiscriminate acts against civilians uh, through bombings and possibly also deliberate, deliberately charging civilians. And so we've seen this type of death and destruction that we read about, and these have legal implications because these are violations of, of war crimes. And war crimes just essentially, in a nutshell, are when nations engage in armed conflict, they're bound by certain rules, certain uh, basic rules, and it's a, you know, it's a little bit strange because war itself uh, allows for legalized killing, uh, but that's a, of individuals who are combatants, individuals who are fighting. Um, so the laws of war seek above all to protect civilians, people who are not engaged in combat or fighting, from unnecessary death and destruction. And this, it, Russia has uh, seemingly breached these principles by exposing civilians either deliberately or recklessly to death and destruction, to to violence that is unnecessary for military objectives. You know, it seems like the first point in almost all kind of procedural discussions, if this is if this is one, uh, where does jurisdiction lie for these war crimes? Well, I think there are multiple places where there could be jurisdiction. There's the International Criminal Court, 
which was set up through a, a treaty in 1998, went into effect in 2001, called the Rome Statute, which has jurisdiction over war crimes. Now, the, that's one, one area. Um, the other area are domestic courts. Some individuals' countries' courts have jurisdiction over war crimes. Um, they can punish war crimes certainly committed on their territory, like Ukraine, uh, but they also have statutes that provide for what's uh, called universal jurisdiction. That is, they can punish crimes, even if there's no connection to those countries or their citizens, just by virtue of this, the universal nature of the crime. It's such an elevated, horrific crime that they can exercise jurisdiction. Uh, so those are two current places where jurisdiction can be exercised. There's also discussion of creating a new tribunal that would be uh, designed to address the specific conflict between Russia and Ukraine and war crimes and other international crimes that may be committed uh, in that conflict. And one of the, you know, the, the issues is that the International Criminal Court is limited in several respects. First of all, not every nation has joined the court. And two of the notable outliers, well, uh, the, a few of the notable outliers are Russia, the United States, as well as China. So, uh, and in this case, Russia is at the center of the conflict. And so they've not joined the ICC, the International Criminal Court. Uh, Ukraine had, had not joined the court, but has accepted its you know, jurisdiction going back to 2014. So you have, uh, so, but the problem is that, that Russia is not a member and has not accepted the jurisdiction of the International Criminal Court. So legally, there you know there are really two issues here. First is uh, you know can the you know can the International Criminal Court exercise jurisdiction over Russian war crimes, and if so, if so, under what circumstances and which crimes? And so under the Rome Statute, the court can exercise jurisdiction over individuals from non-member states like Russia if the crimes are committed on the territory of a member state or a state that's accepted its jurisdiction. So in this case, uh, the ICC could potentially exercise jurisdiction over war crimes, as well as crimes against humanity, another ICC crime that were committed on the territory of Ukraine. However, the ICC under no circumstances really is going to be able to exercise jurisdiction over another crime, and that's the crime of aggression. This, again, is the sort of paramount crime. It's an apex crime that deals with the uh, initiation of the war itself, the planning and execution of an invasion of another country. And so the uh, while the ICC could exercise jurisdiction over war crimes committed by Russian forces on Ukraine, it's not going to be able to exercise jurisdiction over Putin or other Russian leaders who planned and executed the war itself because uh, the ICC has not signed on to the Rome Statute and the crime of aggression is subject to its own jurisdictional regime, its own regime, which does not allow it to exercise jurisdiction over a country that is not a party to the treaty. So uh, that those are the legal you know, issues around jurisdiction, which is one reason why a number of people have called for the creation of a separate tribunal designed for this particular conflict that would be empowered to create or exercise jurisdiction over crime, the crime of aggression, essentially the crime of starting the war. Now, there are a whole host of practical considerations as well, but those are the legal, those are some of the main legal uh, issues surrounding jurisdiction. Right. How does the Hague Convention fit into this situation? Uh, well, that also is a, is a part of the laws of war. Uh, and so that's uh, treaty and customary international law, uh, particularly in terms of the protections of civilians, but and also the use of certain weapons that may have been used. So this could be another basis for charging you know, war crimes against Russian forces. Again, not not uh, for for what's happened in Ukraine. So this is another level of a layer or source of international criminal law that would be relevant to any prosecution. You have the Hague Conventions, the Geneva Conventions of 1949, as well as customary international law. So there's a there's a you know a long body of law that would be drawn on by a tribunal in terms of prosecuting uh, Russian forces for crimes that they committed. Uh, now, in theory, if the if Ukraine forces all, uh, you know also committed war crimes in this conflict, 
And there's been some mention of that, that, that those could be subject to the jurisdiction of a tribunal as well. But, you know, most of the reporting that I've focused, I've seen so far, has uh, focused on the crimes uh, that have been committed by Russian forces at Buka uh, and elsewhere in Ukraine. Since Russia is a member of the United Nations, does it have any jurisdiction to do anything here? I mean, they've mo- removed Russia from the Human Rights Committee, and that's all I've read about so far. Yeah, it's good you bring up the United Nations. It's a uh, one thing. We, it's very important. the The UN is relevant in 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 a few respects. So Russia is a member of United Nations, of course, also a permanent member of the Security Council, uh, which gives it a veto power over. Uh, actions by the Security Council. So this is important in a few respects, uh, mainly as a barrier to any type of accountability mechanism that would have uh, UN authorization. So the, the, the one area where the Russian crime of aggression could go before the ICC is if it was through a UN Security Council resolution. So if the UN Security Council, including the, 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 the permanent members, the five permanent members, United States, Russia, China, France, and England all approved of the authorization. They would all have to support it. Uh, but that's essentially not going to happen under the any foreseeable circumstances while Putin's still in power uh, because Russia will block any action by the Security Council to give the ICC jurisdiction over the crime of aggression. The ICC, the, the UN Security Council could also uh, and has authorized other types of tribunals. So in the former Yugoslavia and Rwanda, the UN Security Council created its uh, tribunals to address the atrocities committed in those countries and regions. It exercised its powers under Chapter 7 for protection of peace and security to create these tribunals. And these were very important tribunals that were created in the mid-90s. So in theory, the even without the ICC, the UN Security Council could create or authorize a tribunal, special tribunal, for Ukraine to address a range of crimes, war crimes, crimes against humanity, as well as uh, crime of aggression. But the problem is that Russia, as a permanent member, will certainly block any action by the UN Security Council. So the UN Security Council in the UN is sidelined in significant respects in terms of creation of a tribunal a war crimes tribunal. Now, it, it can take some actions. The UN can take actions like removing Russia from the Human Rights Council, but those, you know, those are uh, are not going to produce uh, accountability for war crimes. You know, I'm, I'm I'm no UN constitutionalist, but it seems like that's a huge omission. That uh, like there's an automatic conflict of interest about Russia being able to veto its investigation into itself. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it is certainly a conflict of interest, and it, it essentially the international legal system around the UN builds in this influence of these great powers, these powers that were victorious after uh, World War II, and so in some in some sense, some some large sense, the post World War II international legal order, the extent that that such a thing really exists, is dependent on the kind of behavior of the you know five permanent members of the Security Council and the leadership, but this is not. The first time that there have been problems along these lines, and I, I should say, you know, the, I mean, the U.S. very controversially, engaged, you know, invaded Iraq in 2003. Many international law scholars and experts believe this was a violation of the UN Charter as well. So it's it's this is not the first time it's happened. It's just probably the most one of the most dramatic times, and it happened, and it's in the, the center of Europe. So we have no right to complain. I think I think it's important to <laughs> complain, but I think it does. Um, you know, the fact that uh, this uh, that the U.S. as well as other countries have done this before makes uh, undercuts the the consistency of the of the complaints. But um, it doesn't mean that it's it's not valid for to 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 you know call out aggression when it's when it, when it exists. Let's take a look back at what happened in Yugoslavia with Slobodan Milosevic and his uh, extradition and then trial and then. Uh, or lack of a trial, I guess, because he died in prison. Yeah, so the I, this is the ICTY, the, Yugos, the former Yugoslav Tribunal, which was created uh, in the mid-90s to address war crimes, crimes against humanity, as well as genocide, another core international crime in the former Yugoslavia, which broke up after the fall of the Soviet Union, um, and, the, the, and there was a war between Serbia, Croatia, 
Bosnia uh, Herzegovina and other uh, former parts of this uh, empire, which in which Serbia was um, largely though not exclusively the uh, aggressor, and so the basically the UN created this tribunal to address international crimes that were committed during the conflict. And now the tribunal was created uh, as the conflict was going on. And for many years, uh, it was very difficult for the ICTY, the former Yugoslav tribunal, to get custody over individuals and especially over high-level individuals like uh, Milosevic or Radovan Karadzic, uh, all, all of whom were eventually uh, brought before the ICTY. But initially, it was really, you know, the, the first years of the tribunal, it was really low-level individuals who were brought before uh, the court and uh, prosecuted there. So, you know, essentially what happened is the political situation changed internally in Serbia, as well as in Croatia, where it made possible a situation where high-level individuals were brought before the court. Now that So it's it's a really kind of a long game in, in that sense, in that the you know a nation that's fighting a war is not going to subject its uh, or hand over its high level officials uh, to a international tribunal, and so it has to essentially any kind of you know accountability in in that sense has to follow usually peace uh, and then some kind of a, a situation where the country is willing to uh, there's a shift so that a country is willing to turn over its uh, former leaders who are responsible for waging war, committing war crimes and other grave crimes uh, to the jurisdiction of an international uh, tribunal. And I think in, you know, in Russia, that's certainly not happening in the foreseeable future, although it's not clear that, that, that it won't happen ever. I think another very relevant you know, historical marker is the Nuremberg trials after World War II, which are the really the start of international, modern international criminal law, one of the most famous and celebrated trials in this area, in which the uh, Allied powers created a tribunal to hold accountable Nazi leaders for their war of aggression and for the horrific crimes that were committed against uh, civilians, Jews, and others during the conflict. And this was really possible because, uh, you know, the, the Nazis had been completely defeated. There was an unconditional surrender. And so the Nuremberg Tribunal and the Allied powers had, you know, complete control over the situation. That, that, that kind of situation, you know, type of model seems very unlikely with, with respect to Russia, you know, given Russia's nuclear power. And, you know, I think you, you, you you're not going to, Want a situation where there's a, a you know an unconditional surrender like that is not foreseeable given the the you know current military situation, the fact that Russia is a nuclear power, and the amount of death and destruction that that you got to get you got to go through to get to that point. At this point, we need to take a quick break to hear a word from our sponsor. We'll be right back and talk a little bit further about the Nuremberg trials. As a lawyer, ever wish you could be in two places at once? You could take a call when you're in court, capture a lead during a meeting. That's where Posh comes in. We're live virtual receptionists who answer and transfer your calls so you never miss an opportunity. And the Posh app lets you control when your receptionist steps in. So if you can't answer, Posh can. And if you've got it, Posh is just a tap away. With Posh, you can save as much as 40% off your current service provider's rates. Start your free trial today at Posh.com. As a lawyer, insurance is one of the last parts of your job you want to spend unbillable hours on. That's why thousands of lawyers have switched to Embroker. Embroker offers A-plus rated insurance for law firms. You can quote and buy instantly online. And if you need help, they have experts on standby. Go from sign up to purchase in 15 minutes by visiting Embroker.com slash law. That's E-M-B-R-O-K-E-R dot com slash law. And welcome back to Lawyer to Lawyer on the Legal Talk Network. I'm joined by Professor Jonathan Hayfetz. He's an expert on constitutional law, national security, international criminal law, and transnational justice from Seton Hall Law. We've been discussing war crimes, and in particular, right before the break, we were talking about the parallels, if any, that may exist between the current situation and the Nuremberg trials. Anything we can draw from them that's usable here, Jonathan? So the Nuremberg trials offer, uh, I think, important lessons, but also important reminders of some limitations of international criminal law. The 
Nuremberg trials were made possible because there was a complete surrender of Nazi Germany and the Allies had full control over the territory and were able to impose essentially their will. And the, the, what's, what's important about Nuremberg is that the, what the Allies did after World War II was over was not to simply execute the Nazi leadership, which is something that was proposed by Churchill uh, and others, that they should just be brought before a firing squad, but instead to create an international criminal trial to hold them to account, document their crimes, and sort of demonstrate the victory of law over power, or as you know, former lead U.S. prosecutor, associate Supreme Court Justice Robert Jackson said, this was a, a, a unprecedented tribute that power paid to reason. They were going to subject the Nazi leadership to a legal process and hold them accountable in a legal setting through a fair trial. And that, that's some, that kind of aspiration uh, has continued through this day, through other conflicts, the genocide in Rwanda, the, the, the war in former Yugoslavia, other, as well as other matters, and now is continuing to the present with Russia, where there's a goal to hold Russia uh, accountable, but the, the, not to do it through by seeking kind of revenge for the war crimes, the invasion, by subjecting the individuals to the leaders and others responsible to a, a legal process, to trial, to have evidence put on and subject them to legal standards, the legal standards of international criminal law, and if, if proven guilty, to impose legal consequences. So that, so Nuremberg is kind of the, you know, the ultimate overarching precedent for doing this. And it's important in that respect and, and kind of shows how far the international legal system has come in respect, in, in, in the sense that this is sort of how nations view the goal. The goal is, well, the goal is ending the conflict, uh, but the goal after is not simply to punish the aggressor, not to take the aggressor before a firing squad or or something along those lines that was proposed after World War II, but to use this the law and this legal process of international law uh, to impose uh, legal accountability. So that's uh, a remind you know that's sort of a a, a a key overall precedent of Nuremberg, but the limitation which Nuremberg also suggests is that this was only possible after World War II because of the complete and unconditional surrender of the Nazi, of Nazi Germany, absent that type of end of the conflict and that type of ability to impose control, uh, it would have been very difficult to have a, a Nuremberg Tribunal, and so with Russia at some point there will be a choice. Uh, about if there's or maybe a choice between uh, the trade-offs between some kind of diplomatic political settlement and pushing on to try to impose legal responsibility. So it's hard to see a true Nuremberg moment here unless there's some very significant regime change in Russia. What's the burden of proof that's required in the International Criminal Court? And how do, how do prosecutors go about gathering the evidence to be able to meet that burden of proof? So, so the well, the prosecutors are already, you know, looking and investigating to try to gather evidence. I mean, this is a very big challenge. I mean, they have the burden of proof in international tribunals. It, it, I mean, it depends on the tribunal. I mean, it, it you know, it, what the burden of proof is going to be. They can have differing ones, but the ICC has a beyond the reasonable doubt standard. So it, you know, that's generally the generally accepted standard, generally used standard. It's the highest standard in criminal law. And so, you know, to require proof beyond a reasonable doubt, uh, because the you know, international criminal law and its legitimacy, you know, rests uh, partly on the, you know, the fairness of the trial. So you have to have, if the trials are viewed as show trials, uh, they're not going to be viewed as legitimate, and this sort of undermines the whole exercise. So you have this high standard of proof, you have impartiality of judges, and you have a whole range of other procedural protections that would be familiar from, you know, a domestic U.S. domestic constitutional system in terms of ability to, for a defendant to put on evidence, to examine documents and witnesses. So, uh, so they, there are significant procedural protections, including but not limited to the burden of proof standard at the ICC and at other uh, recent international criminal tribunals. But there are also, you know, you know, unique challenges that are posed by applying 
international trials and conducting international trials in an area where, the, you know, there, where there's a war, and especially in Ukraine, where there's an ongoing war, Witness, identifying witnesses, collecting evidence, preserving evidence. I mean, these are all significant challenges. But there's been a lot of experience that's been learned over past tribunals from the Yugoslavia tribunal, Rwanda tribunal, as well as other tribunals in the uh, Sierra Leone and, and other uh, uh, other tribunals that have been set up over the past 20, 30 years. So there's been a lot of experience gathered by prosecutors and investigators in terms of uh, preserving evidence. One other thing is, which, which really came to light in Syria uh, and the conflict there and is now very evident in Ukraine is is the evidence that's provided or made possible by iPhones, social media, and the like. And so that there's a tremendous amount of evidence that uh, is is out there, but it's a question of of identifying it, collecting it, preserving it, ensuring its reliability. But um, that's 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 a process that's going on now, even before you know there's any trial planned, even when there's you know only an investigation at the ICC and only proposals for. Uh, like a special tribunal for Russian aggression. Let's assume that there's some type of regime change in Russia, and it turns out that that uh, it's possible to reach Putin. How do you find the evidence to put his responsibility at his feet? Yeah, so this is another uh, yeah, area and type of evidence, which is to try to prove a leadership crime of aggression. And so, uh, well, I mean, there would certainly be any kind of you know documentary evidence. Uh, orders given, but you would also look at statements that would be made by Russia. You would look at circumstantial evidence surrounding the invasion. And I think, you know, it's, it's Putin in some ways will be, it would be less of a challenge uh, in terms of, because it's clearly he's at the top. He's clearly was responsible for initiating the war of aggression, but how, how far down and, and what other leaders would be held responsible would be a primary focus of the evidence. I mean, who else is responsible for initiating, planning, executing this this war and has a sufficient degree of control that they could help be held responsible for the crime of aggression? That's the aggression part. There, then there's the, the individual war crimes or crimes against humanities that are committed within the conflict. And who is held responsible for those? And there, there's a principle of supervisory responsibility or command responsibility under international criminal law in which it's it's not simply you know the the soldier who uh, executes civilians who's potentially liable it's also those who either certainly ordered it or who knew about it uh, or should have known and, and and disregarded recklessly disregarded this risk so if if you knew or should have known about an execution of civilians or a bombing of a hospital and you allowed it to go forward and took no action after, you could be held responsible for that crime under principles of supervisory liability. So that's another important aspect of, you know, who's going to be held responsible. And that's one where the the evidence will be important in terms of, you know, who beyond the, the actual person who physically carried out the war crime uh, it, you know, it could be subjected to prosecution. If it turns out that Putin is not reachable and neither are his generals or colonels or majors, can they be tried in absentia? Not under the ICC statute. They doesn't allow for in absentia trials. There is some argument among you know some who believe that the human rights human rights law would allow in absentia trials under limited circumstances. There is one international tribunal, or at least one that does allow for it. The tribunal for the former that uh, for former crimes terrorism committed in Lebanon allows for in absentia trials with 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 uh, safeguards. But I think it's you know I think it's a, it's problematic. In absentia trials are very problematic from a due process point of view, and they're problematic from a legitimacy point of view. I think you know any trial where the defendant is not there, especially a trial of this significance, is going to you know face kind of questions and 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 a, and a lot of uncertainties around it. So it's not possible under the Rome Statute. It could be possible under a a newly created tribunal, but it's far from ideal. So I think you know if you if you want to have a tribunal that's enduring as a legacy and enduring as a, a symbol of accountability, the defendant has got to be in the dock. They were in the dock at Nuremberg, and I think that, that you know, in any really successful international criminal tribunal, the defendant has to be there in the courtroom, or you, you know, it's just not going to have the same meaning. 
Right, certainly. Well, Jonathan, it looks like we've just about reached the end of our program, so it's time to invite you to share your final thoughts and provide your contact information if our listeners want to reach out to you. The, the Russia invasion and, and reported war crimes and other international crimes committed in the Ukraine poses a tremendous uh, opportunity as well as a challenge for international criminal law. It's an, uh, an important opportunity because it raises or, or creates the possibility for international criminal law to show uh, its role in preserving the international legal order and to holding individuals accountable criminally accountable when they breach the sovereignty of another nation, unleash a, a, a horrific war, and you know kill you know, thousands or tens of thousands of individuals. At the same time, it creates a challenge for international criminal law because it shows or highlights its potential uh, limitations and its dependence on power realities in order for these goals to be achieved. There's been a clear violation multiple violations of inter international criminal law, but whether and when there'll be accountability remains uncertain. So it's a it's really a, a, a one of the most important moments for uh, international criminal war and, and war crimes and principles of accountability in modern history. So as we wrap up, I'd like to thank our guest, Professor Jonathan Hayfetz from Seton Hall Law. Jonathan, it was a pleasure having you on the show again today. Uh, it was a great opportunity to join you, Craig. Thanks for having me on. We've all seen the horrific images on the videos that Professor Hafitz cited in the discussion, and it's hard to believe that there can't be punishment for that. But it seems as if the problem goes back even further than just this war. It goes back to the beginning of the nuclear age. Once those powers got distributed among the big powers in the world, the balance was tipped in those individual favors. So it's going to be almost impossible to publish Putin unless we deal with that risk of nuclear destruction. And I don't think that's one we want to deal with. This is a tough situation. I don't know the solution. Well, if you like what you heard today, please rate us on Apple Podcasts or your favorite podcasting app. You can also visit us at LegalTalkNetwork.com where you can sign up for our newsletter. I'm Craig Williams. Thanks for listening. Please join us next time for another great legal topic. Remember, when you want legal, think lawyer to lawyer. Thanks for listening to Lawyer to Lawyer, produced by the broadcast professionals at Legal Talk Network. Subscribe to the RSS feed on LegalTalkNetwork.com or in iTunes. The views expressed by the participants of this program are their own and do not represent the views of, nor are they endorsed by, Legal Talk Network, its officers, directors, employees, agents, representatives, shareholders, and subsidiaries. None of the content should be considered legal advice. As always, consult a lawyer. The Paralegal Voice is your go-to podcast for conversations about the latest issues and trends within the paralegal community. I'm Carl Morrison, and together with Jill Francisco, we host the show and examine the topics important to those seeking to grow their career. The Paralegal Voice can be found on Legal Talk Network or anywhere you get your podcasts.